We're going to begin something new today. Uh, every few years, we do a series at our church called The Blessed Life. And The Blessed Life is a book written by Pastor Robert Morris, and it's also a teaching series that he's done several times at his own church. Now, uh, this is the only video series that we ever do via video, which means we have another pastor speak via video to us. And when you see this in a few minutes, you're going to understand why, because God has just given him just a very powerful grace uh, or anointing to talk about stewardship and generosity and, and things like that, okay? Now, I've got some really good news for you, and that for years and years, uh, well, he, brought, he wrote the book, the, the Blessed Life, but then recently, last year, he wrote a follow-up book called Beyond Blessed, along with it, a message series that goes with that. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be diving into what does it mean to be beyond blessed? Now, uh, I think it's God's heart for all of us not to be stressed out about our finances. I want to pause for a second and let that settle in. Why are we doing this? Why are we talking about this? Because God does not want us to be stressed out about money. You can have peace. You can have confidence in the Lord. But it does require us to think correctly about who God is, about the things that he gives us stewardship over, right? And so there's a lot of people here that will testify that the blessed life, the understanding, the teaching, the disciples in that area has transformed their life. And so this is going to be new to you that have seen uh, the blessed life before, but all of us, we're going to grow together in the area of stewardship. So this message is about 25 minutes long. It's the only message where there's a time limit because it's a video. Let's watch it together. So we're going to begin a new series called Beyond Blessed. It'll be four weeks. I'll preach all the weeks. Um, and the title of this message is Living Beyond Blessed. Now, you might think, well, what do you mean by beyond blessed? I mean, if you're blessed, aren't you blessed? How can you be beyond blessed? So I thought of a little natural example, um, and it relates to where I am in my stage of life. If you have a grandchild, that's blessed. If you have nine of them, that's beyond blessed. <laughs> so, so I'm beyond blessed. So what I mean by beyond blessed is that God so blesses us. Not, I'm not talking about materialism. Please hear me. But it's so that we can be a blessing. It's so that we can bless others. And uh, this started, this is actually beyond blessed is the sequel to the blessed life. Uh, in some ways, it's the prequel. They go hand in hand, and I'll explain that. But let me give you a little uh, history of the blessed life. In, we started the church in 2000. In 2001, James Robinson's ministry came to me and asked me to come on the program and teach on giving. And the reason was, James said, because um, I teach giving, the way I teach giving, he was talking to me, he said, the way you teach giving is that you teach that we get to give, we don't give to get. Everyone get that? And there's a lot of give to get teaching going on right now. And so he said, you know, if you, I want you to come on and teach on that. And then he said, and if you can write a book, that would be good. And so I said, well, when, when are you talking about airing these programs? He said, in about three to four months. <clears throat> okay. So I actually went to a friend's vacation home and dictated the blessed life into a tape recorder in three days. And then gave it to a guy in our church who's an editor and ghostwriter that helped put it in, you know, written form for me, who still works with me to this day. He helped me on Beyond Blessed. Very, very gifted writer. And um, so anyway, we, we had it out and we self-published it. Now, let me give you a little background. 90% of all books sell less than 5,000 copies. 90%. 95% sell less than 10,000. Thousand copies, so only five percent ever sell more than ten thousand copies. So we self-published the Blessed Life, and sold two hundred and fifty thousand copies self-published. Uh, then, then we assigned it to a publisher, and now it's in thirty or forty something languages. It's around the world. It's used as textbooks in some places. Millions and millions of copies. It's not just a bestseller. It's still a bestseller in America every month. It's still on the best-selling list. Seventeen years later, and many times still the number one spot. And it's, uh, it's an international bestseller now. Just so you know also, most people know this, but 
I believe in giving the first to God. I believe the Bible teaches that. We'll talk about that a little bit. And when I laid my hands on the manuscript uh, for the blessed life, I felt like the Lord said, will you give this one to me? And so I gave that church to gate, that book to Gateway Church. Gateway Church owns the blessed life. Now, this is something that's so amazing about this. Debbie and I have never taken a dime for, for, from it. This is going to shock you, what I'm about to say. And I wondered whether I should say it or not, because it is a big number. But I just want to let you know how God's used the book. Gateway Church, it brings in about a half a million dollars a year. That one book to the church. So it's, it's unbelievable what God's done with the book. And I believe it has helped uh, spark a movement of generosity in the kingdom of God. And many pastors would agree with that. But right after I wrote the book, I started getting a lot of emails and questions. And people would say something like this, Pastor Robert, I'm giving, but I'm still in debt. And for me, I didn't understand that. Because giving is only one part of being blessed. And... Uh, uh, it's almost like saying, you know, when you talk about grooming, you know, you need to brush your teeth and wash your hair and use deodorant and, you know, all sorts of things for grooming. It, but it was almost like someone was saying to me, you know, I comb my hair, but I still stink. <laughs> well, you know, there's more to it than simply running a comb through your hair, you know. So, so giving is very important, generosity. But there's a huge second component, and that's what we're going to talk about in Beyond Blessed, and it's stewardship. Now, please hear me. Stewardship is not a bad word. It's not a bad word. Many times we, we have a bad connotation of it because a church will say, we're going to do a stewardship campaign. It means we're going to raise money for something. Or I'm going to bring my annual stewardship message. It means he's going to preach on money, you know. But stewardship has to do with every area of your life. So let me explain to you about living beyond blessed. Let me tell you point number one. Point number one is it takes two legs. It takes two legs. Here, here's what I mean by that. I didn't name the blessed life. I didn't name it the blessed wallet. I didn't name it the blessed checkbook. I named it the blessed life. And a life walks on two legs. If you're going to get somewhere you got to be able to move forward by moving one at a time. Even Nick, who was here last Sunday night, you saw him on the table moving his hips, moving from side to side, just moving right, left, right, left. All right, so it's the same thing with being blessed. The two legs are generosity, which I covered in The Blessed Life, and stewardship. Let, let me say it this way. If you, um, if you are generous but you're not a good steward, God will never open the windows of heaven over you. Here's the reason why. Because you won't manage it right. He can never give you a lot of resources because you don't understand stewardship. You're not managing. You won't manage them. And so it'll, be, it'll get wasted. On the other hand, if you're a good steward, but you're not generous, by the way, we call that tight, <clears throat> Go ahead and nudge. So, okay. <laughs> then why would God bless you either? Now, hey, please hear me. Because his purpose is to get the resources to the people who need it. See, if think about the need. All the people who need food, water, the gospel preached, churches built, missionaries sent, all the need. Over here, all the supply, supply and demand would be God. God owns everything. He owns everything. He owns everything in the world. And out of the world, for that matter. He, he owns Mars. You know, he'll, he'll be at Mars when Elon Musk gets there. So he owns everything, okay? So God owns it all. Here's God. Here, here are all the resources, right? All of them. All of them. God has it all. Here's all the need. What's in between? You are. Because God channels, directs, funnels his resources through his children. So he's trying to get it over there, so he'll bless you. But if it doesn't get over there, please hear me. He's going to move on to someone else. He's going to find someone who will be a river, not a reservoir. Because he's trying to help those people who need help. So he blesses. So we can be generous, but here's what happened with the blessed life. A lot of people caught generosity, 
but then they did not catch stewardship or the management of their resources well. And so the blessing didn't last very long because when they got blessed more, they didn't handle it well. They didn't manage it. So that, this is such an important thing. It reminds me of um, when I was growing up, I can't even remember what it was. I just remembered the picture in my mind. I saw some cartoon character and they nailed one shoe to the floor, you know? So, I mean, if you want to just kind of get it in your mind there, you know. So this guy just did this the whole time. Everyone got it because I want to quit doing that. All right. (laughs) That's what a lot of Christians are like. They're either generous and they just keep going in circles or they're tight and they just keep going in circles. But you have to have both. You have to be a good steward and you have to be generous. And here's the, the reason why it takes both legs to be blessed goes all the way back to our patriarch in the faith, Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. This is God talking to Abraham. I will bless you. Notice the idea of blessing a person was God's idea. God said, I will. I want to bless you and make your name great. And here's the reason why. You shall be a blessing. I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. See, God wants his kids to be beyond blessed. We're so blessed that we get to give give away. We get to help people. We get to minister to people. Again, you have to have both. You have to be generous and a good steward. Now, I got three kids, and uh, uh, Josh, James, and Elaine. And James, um, the best way to say it was he was tight growing up. Uh, he, he's uh, all my kids are good stewards, but let me let me just give you the analogy. So I told um, I told all my children when they were growing up, whatever you put in the bank, I will match. James almost broke me. <laughs> he put everything in the bank. When he was 12 years old, he started working part time at a dry cleaners after school, just a few hours a week, and he said to me, "You you told me." you would match everything I put in the bank. Now, not just gifts from grandparents, but what I earned too, right? Like when I earned chores, when I did chores, you did it. So now I'm working here, you're gonna do it. I thought, well, it's just a few hours a week. Well, he started working more in high school. He had thousands of dollars in the bank. And I mean multiple, multiple thousands of dollars. Josh and Elaine borrowed from him. I borrowed from him. (laughs) But I quit because I couldn't afford the interest. So he, he, tight, he's so tight he would squeak when he'd walk. You know, he just was tight. And everybody knew he was. I didn't know he was generous though until a lady wrote me a letter. So when we published The Blessed Life, remember it was Gateway Church that published it. So you you couldn't, this is a Gateway Church is the only place you could get it. And we didn't have but just a few hundred members. And so you had to come to the church to get it. So one day this lady comes to the church. James was 16 years old. He was the janitor. He was our first janitor. So he was cleaning the church building. She comes to the church to buy some books. And she tells the receptionist, she's asking where the bookstore is. She tells the receptionist, "Uh, I didn't know the Lord. And my husband and I were separated and we were just a few weeks away from a divorce. And I read The Blessed Life, and I got saved. I gave my life to Christ. And I said to my husband, I will give you anything you want in the divorce. I'll take no money at all if you'll do one thing for him. But you have to do this one thing. I want you to read this book. He read the book and got saved, and they called off the divorce. That's pretty good. Because they understood to give their lives to the Lord, okay? So she's telling the receptionist this. She said, and I want to buy 10 books to give them away to my friends that don't know the Lord. So she, the receptionist, they talk for a while, and then she tells her where the bookstore is. She goes down to the bookstore. They've already got the 10 books set out. And when she goes to pay for them, the lady at the bookstore said, it's taken care of. I would have never known this, but the lady that got these books wrote me a letter and told me. And she said, what do you mean it's taken care of? She said, well, did you see the young man that was standing behind you that was taking out the trash? when you were talking to the receptionist. She said, yeah, I saw him. She said, that was Pastor Robert's son. And he came down and paid for the books for you. 
I've watched God bless him in supernatural ways. Supernatural ways. Why? Because he manages well what God gives him. And he's very, very generous. And he never tells anyone what he does. He just does it. So it takes two legs to live a blessed life and to live beyond blessed. Here's number two. Why talk about money? I want to answer this question. <laughs> Why talk about money? Pastor, um, I don't think you ought to preach messages on money. And I really don't think you ought to write a book talking about it. Well, um, have you ever read the Bible? I really, I don't, I don't mean that wrong. Have you ever read the Bible? It talks a lot about money. You say, well, I don't know about that. Uh, every time someone worshipped, watch it, they brought an offering. God commanded offerings. God set up tithing. That was not thought up by a preacher, even though you might think it was. A preacher didn't think it up. God did. God put tithing in the scriptures that heaven and earth will pass away, but the word will never pass away. It's pretty amazing. So God did this. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked about it so much, it probably would have upset you too. 16 out of 38 parables talk about money and possessions. So on, here's a good question. Was Jesus trying to get their money? Okay, before I answer that, am I trying to get your money? I mean, let's just come straight out and answer the question. Am I trying to get your money? Now, I never want to be mean, but sometimes I like to say things straightforward. I'm just going to say it straightforward. I don't need your money. I have never needed your money. And you might think, well, you need it to build this church. No, I didn't, because God built this church. And you might think, well, yeah, but he used my money. No, he didn't. He used his money. And I would be very careful about calling the money in your account yours. Because he'll let you know whose it is pretty quickly. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of earth. Matter of fact, that's the, the content of the whole book is whose is it? <laughs> Who's it belong to? Who's the owner and who's the steward? And God's the owner. So God has it all and he directs it through those who will be good stewards and who will be generous because he's trying to get it to a need. He knows what he's trying to do. So I've, I've never apologized for preaching on giving. The reason is I know it's actually a blessing for you to give. I know that. I believe it with all my heart. I wouldn't apologize when I preached to you on marriage. I wouldn't apologize when I preach on prayer. Why? Because I'm helping you. I know in my heart I'm doing this to help you. And I know it will help you. I know it will. So let me just go back to this question. Was Jesus trying to get their money? No. He was trying to get their hearts. That's why he had to talk about money and possessions. And let me read it directly from him, Matthew 6, 21. This is Jesus speaking. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How many times do we get that backward? I've heard pastors even get it backward. They'll say, you know, the Bible says where your heart is, and they're doing it right for the offering. You know, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. That is not what it says. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be be. In other words, it's not there now, but it will move there once you put your treasure there. There your heart will be also. This one pastor said to me, I know if I can get the people's hearts in the church, then they'll give. I said, no, actually, if you can get them to give, <laughs> then their hearts will be there. Uh, another pastor, I was, um, I travel and speak, you know, in other churches and conferences and things. And so I was in this church one time, the guy said, listen, if you see anything in the service, that, you know, you, that can help us, you know, please let me know. So after the service, we went out to eat, and I said, yeah, I, wanna, I did see something, and I want to I kind of put it straightforwardly to you so it'll make an impact on you. And so he said, okay, great. And I said, uh, well, I realize that you don't believe in your heart that giving is a blessing for people. And he said, really? So tell me why. I said, well, uh, when y'all were giving the offering today, you got up and you were talking about it and you said, you know, it's time to give the offering and then you said, but this is not for guests, this is just for members. And I said, so that would be the exact same thing to me 
as next week you get up and say, now we have a, a bunch of 18 wheelers in the parking lot and they are full of new clothes from Macy's and Neiman Marcus and Saks and Nordstrom's and they're brand new and they're all free. They are free, uh, except, now this is not for any of you guests. This is just for our members. I said, see, when you said that, you let me know that you don't believe giving is a blessing. Because when I give people an opportunity to give, I'm giving them an opportunity to be blessed so that they can be a blessing. So that's why we talk about it. And here's number three, being a blessing. We've talked a little bit about it, but I want to cover this a little bit more. Being a blessing. Now, God blesses us for two reasons. I don't want to leave out the first reason. He blesses us because he loves us. You bless your kids because you love your kids. And God does love you, and he does want you to be blessed. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting to live in a safe neighborhood. Nothing wrong with wanting to have a bigger home, more bedrooms, so the kids don't have to share bedrooms. There's nothing wrong with having more bathrooms. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be in a better school district for your kids. There's nothing wrong with wanting to give them braces if they need braces, or help them with college, or drive a dependable car. Nothing wrong with any of that. And what happens is the enemy comes along and it seems like any of those thoughts you have, the enemy says, well, that's just materialism. You're supposed to give up all for Christ. And he just tries to speak condemnation to us all the time. There's nothing wrong with wanting something nice for your family. That's not wrong. So God blesses us because he loves us, but he also blesses us to be a blessing. And so when we talk about that, I want to show you... <laughs> uh, there, there was a book a long time ago, very popular, great book. Uh, I met the guy who wrote it, and we talked and shared, and he's a great guy. But it was, it was a little book called The Prayer of Jabez. You remember that book? Okay. So it comes from two scriptures in the Bible. Great scriptures. I want to show you those scriptures, all right? First Chronicles 4, verse 9. Now, Jabez was more honorable. Just want you to notice that the Bible calls him honorable, even more honorable, but honorable. Than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Now, the word Jabez in the Hebrew means pain, hurt, or sorrow. Okay, that's what his name meant, was pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel or prayed to God, Oh, that you would bless me. Notice he's asking God to bless him and enlarge my territory or increase my income that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil. Watch, that I may not cause pain. Can I say that another way? That I could be a blessing to someone. That I wouldn't cause pain, but I'd cause blessing. So God granted him what he requested. Okay, so he prayed to be blessed. So a real simple question. Was that a bad prayer? Was it an evil prayer? And if it was, then why would God grant it? And why would God call the man who prayed it more honorable than his brothers? So I just want you to notice an honorable man prayed to be blessed and God granted him. Why? So he could be a blessing. Are y'all following me? So is it wrong to ask God to bless you? Please hear me. I want to shout it from the rooftops. No, it is not wrong to ask God to bless you so you can be a blessing. That is not wrong. Let me give you an analogy. Um, let's say you live in a community, it's kind of a farming community, and um, there's a guy in the community that's a mechanic, and he works on people's cars for them, and he will fix single parents' cars for free, and widows' cars for free, and he even pays for the parts himself. Good guy. Um, he helps other farmers when they bring in the harvest. He brings his whole family and helps his kids and all but they, they just kind of struggle to get by. He just doesn't make that much. And so the, the dairy farmer gives him milk and the chicken farmer gives him eggs. And, and let's just, for this analogy, let's say that you own an apple orchard and you give them apples. And uh, then one day another family moves in and you think, you know, I, I probably should help them too. And so you help them. Then another family and the community grows. Pretty soon you're helping five or six families. And then you look at a piece of land that you have that you never planted and you think, you know, if I clear those stones out and, and fertilize that soil, I could probably plant some more trees and I could help more people. So you plant the seeds and then you pray and you ask God to bless you. Is that wrong? 
Are, are y'all following me? It's like the enemy has so messed us up that we should never ask God to be blessed and that if anyone even preaches on being blessed or even talks about finances, oh, that's that prosperity stuff. That's out of whack and that guy's materialistic. It is not wrong to be a blessing. It's not wrong to steward your finances in such a way that when you see a need and God leads you, you can meet that need. Are are y'all following me? That's what I'm talking about. That's what Beyond Blessed is about. Beyond Blessed is about being a blessing. Not being blessed for selfish reasons, but being a blessing. Being blessed so we can be a blessing. Let me tell you one more um, story that happened to me. Debbie and I have some land, you know, outside the Metroplex, and we were driving in one time, and uh, we were going to stop and get gas on the way and go to the bathroom and all. And I started thinking about, now this is going to sound bad, but I'll, I'll explain it in a moment. I started thinking about this drink that I drink about twice a year that someone introduced me to in high school. I told you it's going to sound bad. <clears throat> And I started thinking, I'm going to get, when I stop, I'm, I'm going to get that drink. So let me go ahead and tell you what the drink is, all right? It's Dr. Pepper with peanuts in it. <laughs> how, how many of you have ever heard of someone putting peanuts in Dr. Pepper? Can I see your hands? Ever campus? Okay. How many of you have ever tried it? How many of you like it? How many of you think it's the most disgusting thing you've ever heard of in your... Okay, all right. Okay. So, anyway, again, it's about twice a year. I'm not... I'm not uh, in a, uh, I don't need to go to classes or anything yet, you know, but... Um, but I just got thinking about it. The reason it's pertinent to the story is because otherwise I would just got gas on the card, pay the card at the end of the month, go in, use the restroom, come back out. But I had to go to the counter because I had my craving, you know, that I wanted... Dr. Pepper and peanuts. So, so I went to the counter to pay for it, and there was a lady in front of me who was counting coins out. No paper money, just coins. She bought a dollar and 32 cents worth of gas. So I did what any of you would do. I know you. You'd do the same thing. I went out to the pump. She was uh, about my age, maybe a little younger, and she had her son and daughter-in-law there, and she was buying, a, that was all the cash they had. And I said, I'd like to fill your car with gas. And then many of you know that I give $100 bills away when the Lord prompts me, and I said, and I want to give you a $100 bill. And the reason I do this is because I used to be very messed up. I was on drugs. God saved my life, and God prompts me every now and then to give someone a $100 bill, but I, you have to know that this $100 bill is to remind you that God knows where you are, that he loves you, and that he wants to change your life. This mother of these two uh, grown young people said, she gave me a hug and she whispered in my ear, you'll never know how much they needed this right now. That is living beyond blessed. That's living beyond blessed. But you have to be able to manage your finances so you can bless other people when God tells you to. Would you bow your head and just take a moment here, if you're watching online, just take a moment of reflection. And I'd like all of us to simply ask the question, let's just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this message? Just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? For some of us, God's speaking to us about being generous. He's opening our, he's reminding us of needs that we can meet with people around us. For many of us, he's talking to us about our heart. Stewardship, finances, it's really about our hearts. Does God have your heart? Because that's what he wants. It's not about your money, it's about your heart. Does God have your heart? If you're here and you're far from God, you're, you don't know him personally, 
Can I invite you personally, first of all, to surrender your heart and life to Jesus? That's why he died. Because he wants your heart. And if you're here and you say, Pastor, I, that's me. I, I'm far from God. I need to make things right with God. The first step of that is confession. And just say it out loud. Say, dear God, I give you my heart. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I confess Jesus Christ is Lord of my life and that he died for my sin. From this day forward, I'm following you. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and transform us, God, to think the way you think about our families, about this life, about heaven, but also about our things, our finances. Help us to be good stewards, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.